for you. But uh, we're going to be in the book of John once again, surprise. And uh, we're going to be in John 8 today. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles, there are Bibles in the chairs. You can iPhone, iPad, whatever you got, Android uh, works. I, the U version is a good version of the Bible for an app. Uh, pull that open if you brought your own Bible. We're going to be in John 8, 31 through 50. And I'm going to read that chunk of scripture and then we're going to dig in and I'm going to have three main points. You'll find those already perfectly typed out for you in your bulletin. So all you got to do is take some notes in case God inspires you with something from whatever I happen to say today. So uh, again, I'm glad that you're here. Glad that you're at Glory Baptist Church. It is just uh, wonderful, wonderful to be part of this body of believers because I do, do truly believe that God is doing great things through this church. And so John 8, 31 is where we will be starting, and I'm going to read through the end of the chapter there. If you'd like to follow along, you can also see it on the screen here. There it reads, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, uh, or who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do know, or, and you do what you have heard from your father. You are of your father, the devil. That says in uh, the passage in the ESV, that's the headline. You are your father, the devil. I think that's an interesting uh, interpretation of, of this. So verse 39, it says, They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you are Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he who sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God and hears the word of God, the reason why you do not hear them is because you are not of God. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I, seek, yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So quite a bit there for us to dig in on, and a very interesting passage with all sorts of things for us to unpack. And as we, as we hear this passage, Jesus was, was always making claims about himself, about who he was. 
Claims that either rendered him, uh, this is from, uh, if you've heard it before, C.S. Lewis, that, that the claims that Jesus made about himself would either render him to be completely insane, uh, as loony as a poached egg is the, the example C.S. Lewis says, or truly he would have been evil, or he was who he said he was. He was the Lord of glory. Christianity is all about Christ, of course. It's about the person of Jesus Christ, his person and his work, who he is, who he claims to be, and then our response to that. It's not about morals. Um, it's, it's not essentially about ethics. It's not about a, a philosophy of life. It's about our relationship to Jesus Christ. This man who lived give or take 2,000 years ago, this man who did some of the most, if not the most extraordinary things ever. And then here in this passage, we kind of have some of these claims, some of these extraordinary claims that he makes about himself. We'll look at three of those today, as I mentioned earlier. Three of these extraordinary statements that Jesus makes about himself. Uh, I'm not going to take them in the order because... I felt they had a little better order in my sermon than they do in the, the way they were written. And the first one you'll see there in your notes is simply this, that, that Jesus, if you heard, Jesus claimed to be perfect, right? So let's look at that first. He says this in verse 46. He says to them, Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If you've got a Bible, take a look at that passage. Because this is Jesus' word, and, it, and it's an extraordinary word. Can you imagine if you or I made this sort of statement? You, maybe, maybe like in a moment of anger, like you, you had an argument with your spouse or something, you might have, might have mistakenly said something like this. But, but could you pull off saying something like this? Could you, could you say to the people who did life with you, the people around you, which one of you could convict me of sin? Right? How would that conversation go? Well, let's start that list. I mean, it's like Santa Claus, naughty or nice list, but that list just keeps... Uh, uh, and then, hold on, hold on, I got more, right? Now you sin this way here, and you did this. Jesus goes, with all these people there, all these people who, I'll remind you, want to kill him, he goes, which one of you can prove that I've sinned. He kind of throws the gauntlet down here, doesn't he? Which one of you can prove that I have sinned? That statement is extraordinary in its audacity. Nobody else in the history of the world can make this claim. Jesus says, which of you can prove me to be guilty of sin? And he's saying this in the temple grounds, as we've talked about in the past. It's after the feast is over. And he's, he's in this dialogue about what is true, the nature of truth, and what is false. And he says to them, which of you can prove me to be a sinner? And, and as he does this, he, he, he's confronting them, in fact, uh, making this extraordinary statement and, and he's basically saying to his listeners as he goes through, if you heard me read in this passage, that they wouldn't know the truth if it hit them in the face like a brick. Right? So, while he's not necessarily trying to be offensive, he is going to offend. But he's offending with the truth here. He's pointing them out point blank. You're blind. You cannot see. You think you've seen, but you cannot. And which one of you can prove me to be a sinner? Because you see, he tells them they were not capable of recognizing the truth. Because, yes, they were sons of Abraham. But he says here, as I pointed out, you in fact are literally, so to speak, they're the sons of the devil, he says, right? Not biologically, of course, but in their souls. Lost in their sin. Can you imagine Jesus at the temple, the holiest place on the planet, sitting there on the edges of the temple there, 
with God's people, the Jews, sitting there, them all surrounded, listening to him. They're already angry at him, right? To the point that they want to kill him. And then he says, your father's the devil. How do you think that's going to fly? Right? Them's fighting words. Come on, put up your dukes. Right? They, they, they were incensed. And he says, your father is the devil. And the devil is a liar. He's, he's always been a liar, right? And he'll always be a liar. He lives in perpetual denial. He's, he's blinded the eyes of his children. And by the way, you're his children. You're blind. But me, on the other hand, let's make a comparison. Your father's the devil and you're blind. Me, and he's not saying this cutely, me, my father is in heaven. I've never sinned. I dare you to try to prove it. My father never lies. I never lie. In fact, Jesus was never going to lie, incapable of lying. He was fully God and fully man. His, his life was impeccable. He's whiter than the whitest snow. He's spotless, blameless. There isn't the faintest hint of transgression. He says, I am the truth. And he is exactly that. We say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? So help me God. He didn't have to swear to that. Because he didn't lie, and he was God. He always tells the truth. And he always tells the truth because Jesus was sinless. Now this claim to, to perfection, this claim to sinlessness, this claim to impeccability, has two different aspects to it. In the first place, Jesus was absolutely free from actual sin. He was free from any and every transgression. He had no consciousness of his own personal sin. He never has to pray for forgiveness, right? When he teaches the Lord's Prayer, he's teaching it to his disciples so that they will pray for forgiveness. He's not saying, I'm praying for forgiveness. You need to pray for forgiveness, right? He never confesses sin. He never acknowledges any shortcoming in, his, in himself. He does, as Scripture tells us, exactly the Father's will. And he fulfills it all in absolute righteousness. There's no actual sin in his life. But even perhaps more important than that, Jesus doesn't inherit the guilt and corruption of Adam either. See, we're all tainted by the sin of Adam and Eve, right? Right? We're all carrying this burden that has been messing up the world since the Garden of Eden early in the book of Genesis. God created the world and it was good. Adam and Eve, for a while, had it perfect, but then fell into sin. And the taint and the stain and the baggage that came with that sin carries through to us today. But not through Jesus. Jesus. He didn't have a, a fallen human nature. He had no capacity for sin. There was no foothold in him that, that Satan could get a hold of. There was no lust, no proclivity to sin. There was no possibility of sin arising from within him. There was no dark place hidden in his heart that he didn't want other people to see. Jesus didn't have skeletons in his closet. He is holy. He's undefiled. And he lived a life with sinners, but yet remained separate from sin. His flesh was uncorruptible. And it's not that he was not able to sin, or it was not that not, not able not to sin, it's just that he wasn't even able to sin because he was God, right? And so he says to them, they don't, they don't believe him as God, but he says to them, which one of you, now some of these people have been following for a while, which one of you, can any of you, anybody here, raise your hand, come on, which one of you, you guys, over here, over here, kids down front, one of you guys, 
Which one of you can accuse me and, 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 and prove that I have sinned? Nobody raised a hand. Nobody had any evidence. Because there was no evidence. Attempts had been made to find sin in him. But there was none. Some people might look at the Bible and go, well, he went through the temple that day, right? He like boots over the tables, flips them, whips some people. No, that was a righteous anger. That wasn't sin. He was holy. Absolutely holy. And holiness is intolerant of wrong. He wasn't going to put up with this sin. Holiness doesn't pass a blind eye to transgression. Holiness judges. Faultlessness can condemn because it is right. And Jesus says again and again and again, if you're not for me, you're against me. And all of this comes because Jesus is perfect. It's almost impossible for us to imagine that. That Jesus is perfect in every way. No brokenness like us. Yet, he came to the earth to relate to us. We'll see this around Christmas time and next month. Jesus coming in and being with us and being present. He understood our plight. He knew it better than we even know. Yet, he did not sin. Charles Spurgeon, great theologian, once met a, a man at a train station who came up to him and said, Mr. Spurgeon, I'm perfect. So Mr. Spurgeon looked him in the eye, stomped on his toe. The man started yelling and screaming at him. And Spurgeon said, there's no such thing as a perfect man. But Jesus is perfect. The one and the only one. The sole exception. The Bible records the confession of many sins. And, and one of the one of the more interesting and perhaps more compelling one comes in Psalm 51. Many of you know this one well. This would be David. And it's one of the most moving episodes of King David's life where he talks about the depths of his sin. David was a man after God's own heart. We've been studying him on Wednesday night with our youngest kids here. But David was deeply flawed. The prophet Isaiah, right? Isaiah, all kinds of amazing stories about him. He's very influential as we get into the Christmas season. Isaiah is, is just a really neat book. If you haven't read it, renew it. You know, read it. Go back and see it again. And, and this, this prophet Isaiah, who, 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 who is this mouthpiece selected by God to speak to his people, yet the prophet Isaiah himself very quickly, very readily admits, I am the man of unclean lips. Many who would have seen him would have said, this is the most holy man in all the land, right? The, 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 the greatest follower of God in all of Jerusalem at the very least. He must have clean lips, right? No, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. How about Job? Job was, well, Job was known throughout all the lands, this holy man. Job is, Job is God's guy, right? He's known throughout the world of his time that, for his godliness. Yet... Job repents in dust and ashes. Jonathan Edwards, perhaps the, the finest theologian our country has ever known, once described himself in his own heart this way. I love this passage where he says, My heart is like an abyss infinitely deeper than hell. And that's the reality, isn't it, if we're honest? You and I are sinners. We are. We've transgressed. We've broken God's law. But Jesus, on the other hand, He could say, which one of you could convict me of sin? And He's doing it here with a hostile crowd. A, a group of opponents, so to speak, who wanted to take His life. Which of you can accuse me of doing anything wrong? An absolutely extraordinary claim. The second claim he makes in this passage 
as Jesus claims to be of divine origin, right? You find it in verse 58. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. That I am, we've talked about. All kinds of baggage. He's, whenever he says, I am, that's Jesus saying, I am God. And now he's saying, and they see him standing there, walking among them, right? Jesus is standing in front of me. And you're telling me, pal, you were before Abraham? What? How does that math work? You're not even 50. That's what they say in the passage, right? And Jesus makes several claims in this part. One to the effect that, that anyone who believes in him is never going to die. And the Jews took that in a literal, physical sense. If you believe in Jesus, you will never die. But well, what about Abraham? He died. And what about the prophets? They died. So we don't understand what you're saying, Jesus. It's kind of like, if you remember back when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. And he tells him, one of the characteristics of somebody who isn't a Christian and somebody who isn't born again is that they don't understand what it is that I, Jesus, am saying. And then Nicodemus, of course, says to Jesus, I don't understand what you're saying. And that's exactly what's happening here as well. Jesus is saying to these Jews something they don't comprehend. So he says, before Abraham was, I am. And he's definitely referring to the divine name of God. And the Jews who heard this immediately again thought, blasphemy. No man can claim to be God. And I hear Jesus saying, before Abraham existed, I was. Now, he is the divine Logos. He's the divine Word. And we know, as believers, that there was never a time when Jesus was not, because Jesus was not created. Jesus was, is, and always will be God. Jesus was the one who, who led the people out of the wilderness and into the promised land. He's pre-existent and eternal. There's no sin in Him, and He's always been. His deity, He is God. And He's perfectly and eternally in relationship with God the Father and God the Spirit. Maybe you remember how Paul expands on this. He writes in Philippians chapter 2, when speaking of Jesus, he begins in verse 5, he says, talking about Jesus, who being in the form of God. That is to say, possessing all of the attributes, all of the characteristics of deity. That, that before the creation of this world, before anything existed, Jesus was. He had form. He had existence. He possessed all the qualities, all the characteristics of God. Because He was God. And whatever Jesus was saying now to these sons of Abraham, they heard him saying something that they thought was blasphemous, right? He's claiming to be God. Because he's, he's attributing to himself divinity, this quality of eternality. You see, Jesus, though, is, is more than just a moral teacher. There's more to following Christ, there's more to Christianity than just bringing your kids to Sunday school and, because they kind of deserve it, right? I had to go through it, so they got to go through it. No, that's not what it's about. There's more to Christianity than just being in a social club that gets together and does things with one another. It's about having a relationship. A relationship with the one who claimed and was, claimed to be and was God. The only God there is. And here Jesus is making these astonishing claims of sinlessness and that he exists before Abraham, this eternality. If you and I were to say these sorts of things, I've never sinned. I've been around for 2,000 years. They're going to lock you up. I don't know where the mental institution is right now here in Minnesota, but they're sending you there. 
Because as C.S. Lewis said, you're either a liar, a lunatic, or a lord. You're, you're crazy as a poached egg. If you think that about yourself. Jesus is saying, no, I am God. Because he is God. Because he is the divine Lord. You see, Jesus goes on in this discussion with the Jews to draw out some of the implications of that. One of the implications that he points out to them was that, you know what, buddy? You know what, pal? You know what, folks? I know God, and you don't. Right? He knew God because he had been with him. He had been with the Father for all of eternity. He can describe the very character of God because he knows him. But then he says, but you don't know God. He says that to the Jews. Nor do you really know Abraham either, for that matter. You, you claim to be sons of Abraham, but you really don't know Abraham. Because Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And they were doing anything but rejoicing in being with Jesus. You remember on, on Mount Moriah when Abraham was offering his son up, his Isaac up? You remember the words that he spoke to his son that day? He's binding his own son, he's pulling out his knife to, to sacrifice his son, and he's still saying, God will provide a sacrifice, my son. And yes, there was a ram caught in a thicket. But the true answer to Abraham's vision was the, when the words of John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. That was the ultimate fulfillment of that. And it cannot be more serious than this. There can be no more serious issue in our life than this. Because it's about whether or not we know God. Whether or not we know Jesus. There's a big difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. One is knowledge and one is relationship. I know God because I've come to know Him by faith, by embracing His Son, Jesus Christ, as my mediator, as my, as my Lord, as my prophet, as my priest, as my King, right? You can be close to Jesus in a knowledge sense and still not know Him. One of the, the problematic things in our world today is an abundance of knowledge, but ever-increasing Ignorance. We have an endless wealth of resources to learn about any subject at any time, right? I have a smartphone that I can pull out and look up anything. Infinite biblical resources, infinite information about who Jesus was. And yet, the ignorance of who he was increases. Sad but true. People know of him, but they don't know him. They have maybe some head knowledge, but not heart knowledge. Just like these Jews. A number of years ago, John Krakauer wrote a, a very interesting book. It's called Into the Thin Air. Maybe you've heard of it. Might have seen it at a bookstore or whatever. It's a story about an attempt to summit Mount Everest. And it's a story about some of the leaders in, in this group um, who go up, including Robert Hall and Andy Harris, both of whom died on this expedition. As They died as they came off. They did get to summit, and they didn't survive coming down. And there's a point in which Krakauer, as he writes this book, after they'd been at the peak of the mountain, and if you've not studied Mount Everest, you know, they're 28,000 or 29,000 feet, whatever it is. It's way up there. It's so high that you can't be there without oxygen, like supplemental oxygen. There's not enough oxygen. The air is so thin that you can't literally function 
without tanks of oxygen. So they can only stay up there for about five minutes and then they gotta start breathing in this container of oxygen. Now as they get off of the summit, as they are coming down, they begin to suffer from oxygen deprivation. And this is a common thing. And Andy Harris, in particular, on his way down, was carrying this particular tank. And because of the, the lack of clarity, because of the clouding of the mind, he thought he had used all of his oxygen. Sadly but true, he had a full tank but his brain thought it was empty and nobody could convince him otherwise. His tank was full, but he thought it was empty. He believed strongly enough that he died without using that tank. And in a spiritual sense, there's men and women today in our lives, maybe in this room, who live in that same condition. They think they know but they don't know. They think they are right, but they're wrong. And in the case of Jesus, it won't just cost them their life, but it can cost an eternity. So we need to get this right. We need to be clear about this. We need to understand this fully. Because that's how serious it is. That's what Jesus was talking about with the Jews that day. And then Jesus makes a third claim. Jesus claims to offer freedom. He claims to offer liberation, right? You see it in verse 32. Look at verse 32. Jesus says, You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That verse has been adapted by all kinds of groups, right? And the issue here is one of liberty, one of freedom. These people, the Jews, the people who live today without Jesus, they're in prison even if they don't know it. Freedom is a, a beautiful word. Liberty is a beautiful word, right? We speak of liberty and justice for all when we say our Pledge of, pledge of Allegiance. This is the, the land of the free and the home of the brave. But what is Jesus talking about when he talks about freedom? You will notice in this passage as I read it that, that when Jesus is talking about freedom, the Jews have the audacity to say, we've never been in bondage before. It's like, have you read the Old Testament? Right? Which is very ironic, because they're the Jews. That's what they're claiming, though. We've never been in bondage. But not only that, all they had to do was look around a little bit. Roman soldiers everywhere. The Roman soldiers, the Roman nation had conquered Israel. Before that, the Greeks. They'd been in, captured, enslaved by the Babylonians. The Egyptians, all kinds of people, right? And you're claiming today to meet Jesus that you've never been enslaved. Come again. His very message, as he begins to teach about himself, when Jesus talks about who he is, it is effectively a quote from Isaiah 61 that he had come to preach liberty to the captives. Jesus sees these people and he knows that they are enslaved to their sin. They are lost in darkness. They are in bondage to sin. And he comes to liberate. Jesus comes to free. He comes to break the chains, to unshackle, to set them free of sin and guilt. And Jesus has come to do that for you and for me as well. One of the greatest lies people believe 
is that, oh, I'll, I'll come to Jesus later, right? I'll come to Jesus when I'm ready. I'll come to Jesus when, it's, when I think it's time. I'm kind of having fun right now doing these things, right? I, I like my life. I like my partying. I like my relationships. I like whatever it is. And maybe someday I'll get around to that Jesus thing. But right now, I like what I'm doing. I like who I am. I like how it is. I can, I can do that whenever I want, somewhere down the line. But Jesus says the truth of the matter is, no one can come to me unless my Father draws him. See, it's not up to cho- us to choose if and or when. We cannot just, ah, I'll get to that eventually, whenever I decide it's time for that to happen. We can't do it on our own strength. We can't do it on our own native ability. It takes God working in us, on us, and through us. Because on our strength, on our own, we keep chasing after sin. We are sheep gone astray. We are the lost. We are the blind. And unless Jesus draws you, we cannot come. We cannot believe. We cannot repent. God calls to us. And when He calls, we need to heed that call. He stands at the door of our hearts knocking, seeking entrance into our lives. He stands there saying, I've come to set you free. I've come to show you a way out, out of your sin, out of your bondage, a way out of the prison of that lifestyle you didn't even know you were living in. One of the most interesting men who ever lived is Nelson Mandela. If you've never read his autobiography, I highly recommend it. It's called Cry for Freedom. If you don't know who Nelson Mandela was, South African man, uh, unjustly imprisoned for 27 years. And after he's freed, he goes on to become the prime minister, prime minister of a post-apartheid South Africa. And in that autobiography, he writes about the day that he left Robben Island prison. And he says, as I finally walked through those gates to enter a car on the other side, I felt, even at the age of 71, that my life was beginning anew. My 10,000 days of imprisonment were at last over. Jesus is saying the same thing to you and me, that he can show us the way out of prison. We might live in a nice house on the lake. You might drive a a, a nice car or a nice truck. You may have great vacations. But if you don't know Jesus, you're in prison. You're in bondage to your sin and to guilt. And Jesus is saying, today, today, right now, I can show you. I can show you the way out. I can give you the key that unlocks the door. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that will unlock the gates of the prison of sin. John Owen. John Owens is one of my spiritual heroes, and he says this. He He says, we should know the answer to two questions when we're going to somebody for help. Is that person willing to help us? And is that person able to help us? Is that person willing to help us? Is that person able to help us? Folks, Jesus is willing and he is able. It is only through him that you will find redemption and freedom and liberation. It's only through him you can find peace and satisfaction, restoration with God. We're going to take communion in a little minute. And I would challenge you to think this over. To be serious about it. To leave no more doubt. If you have any questions, bring them 
We can talk about them later. I would love to chat with you. But let us be clear. We enter the gates of heaven in only one way and one way only. And that is through Jesus Christ. Because he was sinless. Because he was God. Because he and only he can set us free. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.